Jesus is getting ready to move in your life. God knows. God truly knows. Let's go to Psalms 39. Psalms 39. God quickened me this morning with this word. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's going to speak to your heart today. Mm. And your members. Amen. Amen. Psalms 39. God's perfect knowledge of you. Oh, somebody. God knows. His perfect knowledge of you. God always keeps you at the forefront of his thinking. Hallelujah. He always keeps you at the forefront of his thinking. Hallelujah. But sometimes you don't keep him at the forefront of yours. But that's all right, God says. He knows. <laughs> you know, the elders used to say in church, he knows every hair on your head. Amen. God knows. God's perfect knowledge of you is perfect knowledge of man and woman. Look at verse 7. Let's take off there. Where can I go, this is David, from your spirit, God? Or where can I flee from your presence? There it is. If I ascend into heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. Behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, somebody, decide to fly away, you're there. If I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, somebody, deep calling unto deep. God says he takes deep. Watch this. He takes deep and puts it in a storehouse. Oh, somebody, can you? The deep. If you ever watch, like I do, I love watching Discovery. I love seeing the things and seeing how far man can actually go or God allows him to go. And the deep is a dark place. They can only go so far because the pressure will not allow them to go but so far. And that's deep. God says he takes the deep and puts it in his storehouses. Oh, somebody, can you imagine? If you think of a storehouse, and then he takes the deep and puts it there. He stores it on somebody. See, this is a revelation of knowledge of him. This is why David always sought God for his precepts. David wanted to know more of God. He wanted to get close. That's why he was always seeking God, going hard, because he desired this knowledge. But he says, if I take the morning or the wings of the morning, you were there, if I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even where, even there, your hand shall lead me. If, you, if your right hand shall hold me, and even in the sea, if you think about some of the things in the Bible, when Jonah was swallowed up in the sea by a large fish taken down to the deep and held there for three days. Oh, somebody. And if I dwell in the ultimate parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. I love that. See, when you're somewhat in distress, notice that God says his right hand will hold you. The only way you can walk out of his hand is by your own free will. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be the light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you. The night shines as day. Darkness and the light are both a light to you. You formed both. Notice, this is why I always and I've always said to you, even in the past, we should never instill fear in our kids and tell them about a booger man and something in the dark is going to get them. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The darkness is the same as the light to God. He created them both. They're the same. God dwells in the darkness as he dwells in the light. He created them both. But here's the beauty of that. Darkness cannot comprehend the light. It's just like we can't comprehend one another. Uh-oh. We don't know what God has in you 
and you don't know what God, we don't know each other's limitations. We don't know how far God is going to take you. Yeah. Only you and God know that. That's why God made it that way. He said, light, you will shine. You will shine in darkness. Even, even though darkness was created as the light and God owns both. They are entities. So then we can dwell in the darkness and find God. And we can dwell in the light and find God. God is everywhere. This is what David was saying. He's in the innermost parts. God knows. He knows where you're at. Amen. But the key here about darkness is that evil thinks that it can hide in the darkness. But whatever it does in the darkness will do. What? What? Come to the light. All somebody. Just put me over. God is always omnipresent. He's everywhere. God knows. So you need to understand and begin to flow where he is. Amen. Amen. I'm always telling my wife this. I say, you never have to worry about me doing anything that's illegal or otherwise. Why? Because God knows. Because I walk in humility and the fear of the Lord because I don't want him to get me somebody. Because he knows. He knows, David said, your innermost parts. He even knows about those sin members that are in your body. Come on, somebody. He knows your temple that he created of clay. He knows. He knows what he put in you. He knows. Go with me then to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's talk about some things that he knows. God knows your strength and your weaknesses. You know, in the world, the first thing you will happen to you when you go, in most cases, on an interview, they want to know your strength and your weaknesses. God already knows these things. He knows your strength and your weaknesses. But the key about your weaknesses, when you're weak, God is strong yes, in you, is. oh somebody. When you're humble, that's when you're strengthful. Hallelujah. Samson didn't really do all the work until he became weak. Oh, somebody. And Samson was the strongest man on earth. But he didn't really, was, he wasn't able to do great works until he became weak. He had to be humbled. His, his secret was gone. His hair was gone. And he was blind. He asked God, he asked him, he says, God, give me one more anointed blessing. Give me one more anointed blessing. And so God did. But notice what happened to him. Samson had destroyed a lot of enemies. He had, to, he had killed the Philistines. That's all he did. But there wasn't that many compared to the ones that he killed at the end when he was made humble. When he was made humble, notice, when you're humble, that's when you're strong. God loves the humble. He raises the humble up. That's why when you get down, when the enemy thinks you're down, God will raise you up. This is why he says he loves the widow and the downtrodden. The poor and the need. Don't you worry about what the world is doing. God's got them too. He knows. You just remain with God. And remain in humility. And in the fear of the Lord. And watch Him do work. In you. Again, let's look at chapter 4 verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy. We have this ministry. So we're here today. Through this ministry. We do not lose heart then. Whether we have renounced, we have renowned secrets. Notice, the secrets of the Lord are for those who love him. Those then he will show his covenant. The fear of the Lord are for those who love him. Those he will show his covenant. The secrets of the Lord. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry. Notice, God reveals some revelations to you. Just now. We do not lose heart then. Rather we have. 
renounced or renowned secrets in shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of the Lord. Notice we always talk about how we are a word church. Because I always like it when you can go back and find this in your Bible. And God speaks to you somewhat differently, but he confirms to you what his word says. On the contrary, then, by settling forth or setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone, conscience in the sight of God. Notice, conscience in the sight of God. Everyone has a conscience and a subconscious. You have a conscience and a subconscious. Your conscience is where you're at now, here, right now. But what you take in later on, your subconscious will remember that. Your subconscious. Your eye gates allows things to be imprinted on the back of your subconscious. And then when you get into a situation, he calls it back to your remembrance. Absolutely. It's just like a child who stuck his hand and the fire. But then as he gets older, he noticed when he gets close to heat that his subconscious tells him that that's an error and you don't do that. So God always speaks to us consciously. But watch this. This is what he says. He commands our he, he command ourselves to everyone's conscience. He speaks plainly the truth. It's commended. And even if our gospel is veiled, notice what we teach, the world does not receive. He says, even if the gospel of Jesus Christ is put under a veil. Notice, if it's put under a veil, that means they're not comprehending it. They're in darkness. They're living out their evil lives and they're thinking that they're hiding from God in darkness. But we know that they're in darkness. We know that they're doing those deeds in darkness. Even though we're in the light, we can see and know evil as it stands and it tries to hide because it has to try to hide. It tries to hide behind a lie. But we being of the children of the light, we can see in the darkness and we see the lie. So here's God. Watch this. And even if our gospel is veiled, even what we preach, even what we teach, even what we believe, if it's veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Notice, our people perish. And actually, I always say destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Notice, they're under a veil. They're under a veil. And if our gospel then is not received and it's under a veil, it's, it's under the veil to those who are lost, to those who are perishing. The gods of this age are blind. The minds of the unbeliever. The God of this age blinds the unbelievers. If you are an unbeliever, then the enemy can come in. Oh, somebody, you may recall the individual in Vegas who killed all those people. They still have not found a motive. But I know what the motive is. He was an unbeliever. If you are an unbeliever, then you are hiding behind a veil and the enemy can come in. God says that he allows the enemy in if you are an unbeliever. Watch what he says. Look at the word. Don't believe me. He says the God... Of this age, what is it? The God of this age is what? That's the enemy. That's all those religions or different facets of new age, atheism, and all those things. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Notice, the unbelievers' minds are blinded. So if their mind is, un is, is blinded, then that means the devil can come in because they don't have Christ. So then the individual, when you think about it, why did he do what he do or did what he did? He had to be an unbeliever because if he was a believer, then the enemy wouldn't have been able to get in and cause him to do those things. 
There's a reality in this as well as a spiritual fact. Because what other solution can you come up with? There's no motive in terms of why he just did this. Why does people do what they do in a lot of cases? There's no rhythm or rhyme or even reason sometimes people do what they do. Why do people hate us when there's no reason to hate us? Why do they do it? Because they're falling into this unbelief. We as children of the Lamb, of the light, we believe in Christ Jesus. We believe in this gospel. And our gospel tell us to what? Forgive. Our gospel tell us to, to love. Our gospel tells us to have charity. Our gospel tell us to follow righteousness. Our gospel tells us to flow in the fruit of the Spirit because that's what Jesus flowed in. That's what our gospel does. But our gospel is under veil for the unbelievers because they don't receive Jesus. If you don't receive Jesus, then you're going to fall into diverse temptations. And you're going to remain there and spiral down. It's pretty logical to me. It sounds pretty sound to me. For what we preach is not for ourselves, mind you. Again, the gods of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for Christ's sake. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness. There he is. Let your light shine out of the darkness. In other words, when you enter a room, you don't need to say anything a lot of times. If there's a room full of atheist people or, or people that are unbelievers and they're having a conversation, this has happened to me. I don't know about you. If I enter in a room, they don't know who I am, and I don't say it because I have to enter in a lot of rooms. I enter in boardrooms. I, I enter in you know, meetings and conference calls all the time. But when I enter in, I notice one thing. The conversation that was going on that may not have been of Jesus stopped us. I notice that, and I say nothing, absolutely nothing. I had an individual speak for me one time to another individual, and I knew nothing about it, but I received an email. And they told this individual that, do not speak to this God-fearing man. <laughs> I thought that was really amazing to me, that somebody else saw that and was telling another individual, and I guess I really wasn't supposed to see the email, but they were talking about a meeting that we had had and how we need to conduct ourselves. But that in itself let me know that God had already went before me. Amen. Just to lay it out. And that's what the children of the light is. When you come into darkness, the darkness cannot comprehend it. Amen. And the darkness will most likely flee. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So you begin to understand who you are and the fact that God knows. He knows. He lays it out for you. He lays it out for you. So then let your light shine out of the darkness. This is the word. Make his light shine. Make Jesus' light shine in your hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God. A glorious display in the face of Christ. This is how we flow. This is how you conquer. This is how and why you can say greater is he that is in me that is in the world because you're flowing in this gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about the gospel, we're really talking about Jesus inside of us. And I love it because, see, I know that when I'm truly in the anointing, that you see the Jesus in me, and you couldn't see the Jesus in me, Unless the Jesus in you allowed it, or showed it to you, I should say, revealed it to you, then it's confirmed in your spirit. 
Therefore, we do not lose heart, I'll say, though outwardly we are wasting away. I like that. Because nobody knows. <laughs> you know how it is, saints of God. Oh, we can look really good, man. We can put on nice dresses, nice suit, get our hair done, look at fire. But then inside, only he knows. Oh, somebody. Only he knows what's going on inside. And our outward parts are wasting away, meaning we're just getting older. We're aging. Oh, but we're aging gracefully. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> We still got it going on outwardly, amen? <laughs> but God knows the inside turmoil and battles that we face. Yes, he does. And how do we deal with it? Thank you, Jesus. How do we deal with it? Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. There it is. Because God says that's why we are to renew our minds. Oh, somebody. Remember that thing I was telling you about, about the conscious and the subconscious? The thing about the reason our mind has to be renewed. Let me give you something. We do stuff all the time in the world. Remember our gates, whether we hear it, our eye gates, or we our mouth gate, a lot of things, these are our gates. This, this is what allows things in. And then whatever we see, and do gets etched in our subconscious mind, and then when our subconscious mind deems it necessary, it calls it back to our remembrance. When we were out there, I'll give you an example, and some of you probably have, have, have dealt with this at some point. You know, when we were out there in the world, there's things that we saw. There's things that we saw on TV, I'll give you an example. If you, Kirk Franklin told a story one time, he used to like to watch porn. So if you watched porn, your eye gates saw that. You wouldn't know about porn and all the things that go on in porn unless you saw it. Once you saw it, your eye gate takes that and puts it back into your subconscious mind. There it sits. Then as you're going along, now that you're saved and going along, trying to live a life of Christ, here comes the enemy. You see something. The eye gate sees something, and it calls back to your remembrance about that pornography. And now you have to fight to resist the devil. Submit yourself unto the Lord, and then resist the devil, and he will flee. So he's always coming back at you about your past. This is why Christ says that you are to be renewed a new creature every day. Well, how, you might say, well, Pastor, how do I renew my mind every day? With the word of the Lord. You continue to place the word of the Lord before you. You read your Bible, and then you pray. You do these things every day. This is why God told the children of Israel, and you know how they just decided to play when Moses left. He told them, y'all need to write this stuff on your forehead because y'all can't remember no farther than your, your nose. Write it on your forehead and then tie a ribbon around your finger. Put it on the doorposts of your houses. We do that. We got, we got scriptures on our doorpost. And we decree nothing comes in unless it's of God. Amen. Unless it's of the Holy Ghost. Unless Jesus sent it. And I've seen people come to my door and stop. And I talk to them right there. Matter of fact, I walk out. Because they won't come in. And I know because of how we pray. And so therefore, this is how you renew your mind. God has forgiven you. You need to forgive you. And now walk into the newness of Christ. Renew your mind. Every day. Every day. For our light, he says, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and monetarily and our troubles or achieve for us as eternal glory for our ways. For our ways, all of that. Our light does. It for our ways, the troubles. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, 
us. This, this is why we're talking about the eye gate. He says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. sight. Mm -hmm. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen because we see a lot of foolishness out there. Mm -hmm. So we, he says, we fix our hey, eyes not God. on what is seen, but what is unseen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. This is how we stay renewed. Yes. Because if we see our old past, it brings back old memories, and the enemy comes in and tries to bring us down. He always tries to remind us. That's why we have to put on the whole armor of the Lord, the shield of faith, to block those fiery darts that he's sending. The helmet of salvation to keep our mind renewed. Yes, Lord. The word, the sword of the Lord, so that we can continue to stay in the word. Then gird up our longs with truth because if we verily, verily, I tell you the truth and we know the truth will always set you free. Yes. Yes. And then walk in peace and in love with the foot shows of the gospel. See, when we do this, we can begin to renew our minds, walk victoriously in Christ. God knows. He knows you can do this. He put it in you. He put the power in you. Greater is he that is in me, that is in the world. Especially when we know the gospel, when we know the way. So he says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is only temporary. No, and it's true, so true. Because you know when you're passing, when you're riding along, you see a lot of things. And you ever been riding down the road and you've gone this way maybe many times. And then all of a sudden, there's something else that you hadn't seen. Because all that other stuff was temporal. What you needed to see is what you didn't see before. So it's temporal. The eye gates, what you see on TV is temporal. You know, the stuff that comes on commercials will be here today and gone tomorrow. The shows, they go out of style. Everything goes away. Temporal. So then we don't fix our eyes on that. He says, instead, what is unseen is eternal. There it is. And that's the word. God knows. God knows. So then, this is what and how you are to regard all of this that I'm telling you today. As a servant of Christ. And as those that are entrusted with the mysteries of God that he has revealed to you today. So if he's revealed to you some mysteries about some things, then you just give him a way of offering. So then now it is required then that those who have been given a trust must prove to be faithful. And you heard me talk about that many times. Once you have this profound knowledge, walk in it. Be faithful. That's what the gospel is all about. I know it's one thing about Jesus in this gospel, there's always newness in the word of the Lord. You ever notice that? How you can be reading and all of a sudden you go somewhere else and there's something that you can cling to that really clicks in your spirit, which causes you and fortifies you even more, knowing these things. I love it because of the fact that even though the world is chaotic and we understand that, we don't know what's real or not real anymore in the world. We don't. The enemy has taken a good, taken the good and turned it into evil. He, he makes it, he's beginning to, to take good and makes you think that evil is okay. And, and, and now good is bad and, and evil is okay. Really? He also taken the, 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 the now he's got whereas, he's gotten whereas, He's taken what's right and he's changed that and turned that into what's wrong. Oh, some of you are looking at me like, wow, oh, Pastor. Yeah, that's an evil spirit that has gone throughout the nation. Well, all you gotta do is look at the news. Every congressman, they, they, they've been doing this for years, they just got caught. And they've been taking our money and paying for their evilness. Now, here's the thing. Whatever you do in the darkness yes. must come. Amen. 
This is why it's being revealed. They're not doing that. All this stuff, the, the women are not doing that. Y'all saying these women are no, oh somebody. They, 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 God is doing that. That's right. That's right. God is revealing this evil in the darkness that they have hid for years. God says, I've got to clean it out. Whether this president of ours, you like him or hate him, he blew the trumpet. He said, we're going to get the swamp clean. <laughs> That's what he said. And what's been happening ever since he pronounced that or proclaimed that? And I don't even think that came out of, I don't think he did that. I think God put that in his mouth. Oh, somebody said, well, my master, that's, 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 you know how we feel. Well, let me tell you, God will put a word in our ass. So don't be sitting there looking at the man. You better be trying to understand the, yes. what God says. Yes, yes. And when you see that, oh, somebody, only the children in the light can hear the word of the Lord. And I don't care if God put, God will put a word in a dog, he'll put a word in an ass. I've had people who, did, who just didn't like me. I walked up to them and they said something to me and I knew it was God. They probably looked at themselves and said, I don't believe I said that. <laughs> but God. Yeah, God did it. He said it to me. I had a guy when I got ready to leave a company one time, he walked up to me. He said, I can tell, William, you're going to be vice president and president of your own company one day, probably president of other companies too. And this guy didn't know me from Adam. I worked with him, but when he said that, I looked at him and I thought to myself, why is this man saying this to me? But it came to pass. You have to understand, God will put a word in anybody for you when he's trying to speak to you. Notice, because if you look at the book of Jacob, Elijah didn't go to him. He sent another prophet. Mm -hmm. And Jehu played it off. Jehu says, oh, that ain't nothing. But Jehu took that same word that prophet had told him, went to his boys, and said, they said, Jehu, what did the man tell you? We know he told you something. What did he say, Jehu? Jehu says, he said I was going to be king. They all bowed down. <laughs> and this boy didn't know he was going to be no king. So you have to understand. Amen. This is what God is doing. He's wanting you to be faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Now let me finish up with a story that's going to sum all of this up. This is going to help somebody because I talk about this all the time. I'm going to talk about Paul again. One of my favorite apostles because Paul did a lot of things. We know Paul was a successful man prior to him yeah, being this. brought to the ministry of Christ. Shit, Paul had to deal with some things in life. It wasn't easy for Paul, but yet this man accomplished great things. We have to understand, if you ain't doing nothing with God, you ain't doing nothing. But when you're working for God, you've got to be buffered. Because if you ain't doing nothing, the enemy ain't going to bother with you, in most cases. If you're already down in the dumps, he don't need to mess with you. All he's going to do is go find somebody else in the dumps, and they'll get with you. Because what? Misery loves company. And he'll try to collect as many folks that are down in the dumps and in misery to get with you. And once they get with you, then you will all do more corruptible things. Like, oh, let's smoke some dough. Let's take some drinks. Let's go down here and try to ease our troubles and sorrows. But then, but if you're doing something with God, the buffering that you have is going to be put to naught. But it won't go anywhere. It'll go away for a season. But it won't stay with you. Jesus was buffered. Did you forget it? On the high place, he was buffered by Satan. In the garden, he was buffered by Satan. But at the end of the day, he had to beat that very same demon, that enemy that buffered him all that time. Amen. So there is victory in all of this. But let's talk about Paul. Let's go quickly, and we're going to finish up. 
This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I have to finish this up. Because you need to get this. Because some of you are experiencing some things. And you think just because I'm a child of God, why am I going through God? Why are these things happening to me and I'm a child of God? Paul was a child of God. So let's talk about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, verse 1, he says, I must go on boasting. Notice, he says, I must go on boasting. And this is the thing about Paul. But he didn't boast about himself. He could have. Paul says, if I do that, it's just be foolishness. He, he could have. You can't, you shouldn't boast about yourself. The Bible says, let another speak well of you. You don't have to, that's what I'm saying. You never have to go anywhere, saints of God. If you who you are, if you're an elder or a minister or whatever, you do not have to go and proclaim and announce yourself no matter where you go. Amen. People are going to know. Now, so Tony didn't tell me anything. God showed me who she was. I'm not going to tell you who she is. <laughs> but God showed me who she is. And most of you that get to know her, you'll find out who she is. Amen. And where she came from. See? See, God will let you look humble. But deep down, he has something powerful in you. Yes. This is Paul again. He says, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained from it. There it is. There's nothing to be gained from boasting. The Bible says, let another speak well of you. Mm -hmm. So if you go into a risk, like I told you, when you, if you are a child of the light, and you go into a place of darkness, they're going to know who you are. Automatically, God's going to reveal it. And you don't have to ask nobody to, to can you pray for them. They will come to you because God will change their heart. Notice Jesus says, God, I'm only going to pray for those that you sent me. Notice, Jesus said this to God. Only those that you send me. Mm -hmm. So God has to send them. You can't do it. God has to send them, and then he'll open your heart and their heart for you to pray for them so that they'll be get delivered. All the disciples was like that. Remember Peter? You remember uh, was it the eunuch that was it? That God had sent him, had sent Peter over to, 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 to Cornelius. See, he always, and he prepared Cornelius' heart before he sent Peter, a man of God, to pray. Mm -hmm. God always does You don't have to announce yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to boast about anything. Mm -hmm. Just be humble. God will raise you up. So he says, although there is nothing to be gained from it, I will go on to visions and re 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 revelations from the Lord. So God says, Paul says, I'm not going to boast of myself, but although there's nothing to be gained from it, I will instead boast on the visions and the revelations from the Lord. There it is. I'll boast about that all day long. Yes. Oh, I'll be happy to tell you this testimony, that testimony, what God did for me here and there. I'll boast about that all day long, especially as visions. You need a vision. You need a vision from God. Yes. And you need to have a vision that God put in you to do. Men of God, women will never follow you unless you have a true vision of God. You will, you will, you will not get them to yield on any subject matter or anything else unless you have a true vision from God. So that, so that you can be a good leader in terms of being the head. And you can stand. And then they'll see it. Because God will show it to them. If it's from God. He'll show it to her. And then she'll yield. But not until then. So women you don't have to yield. Unless you can see the vision in that man. If he has no vision you need to let him go. Mm -hmm. Cut him Like a hot potato. <laughs> you know, because he's gonna lead you to hell, and you don't need nobody. Now, you know what they say, women? I can do bad all by myself. But see, if you're by yourself, guess who you got? You got Jesus as your husband, and he's better than any husband. 
So, because I'm always telling my wife, I'm, I'm walking in Jesus, so I'm your husband. Man. I'm taking my place. Amen? Amen. So this is Paul. He says, instead, I'd rather boast on the, on the Lord. I know a man, and notice what he says. Then he tells his story about Christ. Look at verse 2. He says, see, now he's boasting in the Lord. He's not, he's not going to boast about himself. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago who was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. There he is. God knows. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows. God knows. God knows. God knows. He was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one else is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses, he says, except about his weaknesses. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than warranted by what I do or say. Or because of those surpassing great revelations that I've already seen and heard. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. There it is. All of us. All of us. Must have some type of buffer. Because Paul said, he had to have this, otherwise he became conceited. Why? Paul was already a great man in the world. He was well respected among the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees and Sadducees respected him. The Roman Empire respected him. Paul was a Roman. He was a Jew. Paul was all things. He was everything, plus this man was very intelligent, smart, had all of the degrees, he had everything in the world. He had it all. So even though he had that, then he began to walk in Christ. Notice what he did there. He was walking in Christ just as powerful. He was doing performing miracles, writing books, writing letters. He had the most books of any apostle. Of all of them. He wrote all of the Pauline epistles. He wrote all of those books. And yet, when he was walking around, he went through trials and tribulations. He was beat. He was whooped. He was thrown down. He was stoned. But yet, the boy got right back up. But in spite of all that physical abuse, the enemy would show up in the nighttime, telling him, trying to remind him of who he was, telling him that he was a murderer and a no good, a liar, a cheat, that he'd kill folks. This is what the enemy did to him. And he complained about it. He was, he was vexed. This, this buffering of the enemy vexed him, brought him down. But it kept him humble. It kept him seeking God. In spite of all that he was going through, it kept him. Amen. It kept him humble. Yes. It kept him from being conceited. Because if he hadn't had that, think about what he would he have done all the things that he would have done. Would he have pressed into God? Would he have got on his knees time and time again? Would he stay with God day in and day out? Would he trusted God, knowing that God was there with him? Amen. See, this is why we cannot, somebody, all of the things that you've done, all the successes that you've done, everything that you've done, now you have decided to give it all to Christ and walk it out. So that you're walking it out, guess what? The enemy says, God, now I must buffer them. Otherwise, they'll become conceited. I must press in on them. I must test them. Jesus was tested 
Why do you think you're supposed to escape this stuff? And Jesus is going to do it. And he did great works. Paul said, he says, God knows. God knows. God knows. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than I am. Because of these surpassing great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. If you can imagine, I've seen some things and I shared one thing with you about a huge demon that came to me in a vision to kill me. But yet, God spared me in order to convince me never to doubt him again. So I was, this, this, this came easy for me to understand. A tormentor of this size, a tormentor from Satan, directly from Satan, to torment him constantly. And God would not remove it. But look what he tells him. We know the story. He says, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times, he says. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient. So it all survived. So if you're dealing with some things, if you're dealing with some things, survive. God's grace and his mercy all endures forever. Hallelujah. It's going to keep you. You need not worry about what the enemy does. He's there for a reason to buffer you, to keep you on your knees so that you'll know who God really is. You have the light, God knows. Greater is he that is in me than what? He that is in the world. And that's who, that's who you are, Paul. Deal with this. We have to understand Jesus. That God got us. Yes. I don't care what the world is doing. I don't care what spirits are coming at me. Because I'm going to get on my knees. And know that he's going to deliver me. He's not going to leave me or forsake me. Oh, somebody. Let me help you. Because some of you, look, you watch the news too much. I don't care whether it's this president, the last president, the president before that, or the president before that. God kept you through all that mess. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody, let me help you. Whatever program that was out there, God used it to bless you. With. Come on, somebody. God used it to keep you. You were able to benefit from something, something positive happened that God used for your sake. Not for, but for your sake, woman and man of God. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Amen. He knows he keeps his people. Notice, he says the unbeliever, he puts a veil over their eyes. They flow in the darkness, but you flow in the light. You know these things. You've seen this evil before. It didn't stop you then. What makes you think God's going to let it stop you now? You ain't going to lose nothing. In fact, you're going to gain from it all. Because God's going to keep you. And those that don't know him, they will fall. They will perish. This is what the word says. Three times he got, he said he had pleaded with him. But my grace is sufficient. My power, my power, my power. God's power. See, this is what the, oh God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. My power, he says, is made perfect in your weakness. <laughs> oh, somebody, when you're weak, he is strong in you. So when I got a little weakness, somebody, oh, somebody, I, I got me, oh, and, and get ready, dear one, we're getting ready to fast, so when you get a little weak, oh, somebody, you need to call on him. You need to call on him. 
But I, I, I didn't even, when I, I used the bathroom, and I'd be got downstairs, I'd be coming up the stairs, and I'd be hungry. I'd be on the heat up my leg. I'd be, I'd be coming up the stairs, and I'd say, oh, Lord, though I'm weak, you are strong. Then I'd get a little boost and get on up the stairs, drink some juice. Amen? But, I, <laughs> but th there he is. There he is. He says, Therefore, he says, I'm glad about my weakness. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardship and persecution and in difficulty. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God knows. God knows. God knows. And finally, verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice then. Strive. Oh, somebody. Strive. Why would we be striving? Because we released, we released at the beginning of the year. Striving mode. Not survival, but striving. Okay. Notice what God did. He ended us. Look at this scripture. You need to get this. This is verse 11. This ends somewhat our year in terms of where we started from in our thriving mode. And to me, strive is like thrive. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive, strive for restoration. God's going to restore everything. Yes. Anything that you missed last year that you didn't quite get, God's going to give it to you. God, all somebody need to stick their hand up and say, God, I receive it. I receive it because, see, you need a double anointing. There's a double anointing. Oh, you think what you got was cool? Watch this. Watch this. Watch what happens this year for you. Oh, see, it's an, oh somebody, God's going to, he's going to, listen, he's going to cause the world to bless you. Amen. You watch. God's going to cause the world to bless you. So get ready to receive it. Just give him a hand. Wave. Amen. See, because he says, finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Yes, he will. Greet then one another with a holy hug. I preach this all the time. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace, may the grace, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just give him some praise, somebody. Hallelujah. Thank him in advance. He's getting ready to bless you like you ain't never been blessed before. Thank you, Jesus. Call somebody because you stood the test of time with God.